listening to the Ball Talk podcast with me, Ryan Bailey. This podcast is brought to you by Adapt Athletic Performance and Therapy. Head over to Instagram and give them a follow at adapt underscore clinic. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to leave a like, share it with your friends and hit that subscribe or follow button as well. Without further ado, let's get straight into the podcast. Hi right, folks, you're all very welcome to episode number 52 of the Ball Talk podcast brought to you as always by Adapt Athletic Performance and Therapy. And today's guest is Gold Coast Suns' very own and Sligo's own, Luke Towie. Luke, you're very welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Luke, how are you keeping? Yeah, going well. Not too bad. It's just um, training away, getting ready for games. So we've had two games so far, um, pre-season games. Keep going with that and just keep uh, keep trying to improve, I suppose. Tipping away, good stuff. Luke, the first question I have for you, and it's something that I've been trying to bring into the podcast as much as I can, and it actually suits you perfectly because you've come across on TikTok for me a lot, and you got a bit of a voice in you. You can play a bit of guitar as well. So the question for you, Luke, is you've got a golden ticket, a dream concert, Luke Towie's dream concert. So you can have this in any venue. It could be any three acts. They could be dead or alive. So it's, it's your ideal scenario. And just to give you a bit of context and a bit of uh, a few examples in that, like, you know, Raf Cotaro threw in the Spice Girls. I think last week, Benny Kenny had, um, had a bit of Bruce Springsteen in there, a bit of Code Line. So, you know, getting a bit of a feel for what sort of music people like. So I know I'm putting you on the spot, but what would you reckon yourself? No, you're all right. And um, you screwed me there with that little comment at the start. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, what was I going to say? So I reckon I'm a big Oasis fan. And um, so I love them. I'd have to go with them. And I'm hoping that they get reunited. Please, God. Um, I get, another one is a bit different, Christy Moore, because I suppose dad listened to him a lot. And I suppose I was brought up basically on Christy Moore. I've gone to see him a load of times. So I definitely have to throw him in there again. Hopefully get to see him again um, before um, sometime when I get home. And then last one... Oh, I've been listening to we've been listening to Cara a bit cold play a bit. I feel like they will be in we've just every time they come on, we're just like I reckon they'd be unbelievable in a in a live concert. So I'm gonna yeah. throw them as well. Probably pretty yeah, ones that you've heard before, but uh, yeah, no, they're they're said before for a reason as well. Exactly. So, you're out in Australia, of course, Luke. And talk talk to me about the AFL. We'll dive straight into that and your first experience with it, not going to uh, to the trials and that, but your first experience of of even watching it, coming across it as as a young fella, like, was it something that you could see, like, geez, I'd love to give this a crack, or did you ever actually see it, see yourself getting the opportunity to do it? Absolutely not, no way. Um, I still feel so lucky, like, that I've got an opportunity to do it. Um, I suppose I was just like, I love playing football at home, and I was just really putting everything into that, and I could see nothing apart from, like, me playing football for Sligo for the rest of my life, like, and I just, growing up, like, that's all I ever wanted to do. And um, so like I put so much time into that and then it just kind of happened and I suppose I got a call and I ended up coming over and my first experience I'd never really watched any games before and um, I'd heard of obviously a couple of Irish players over here obviously Red Oak was kind of the year before me so I that was on my radar a bit I know Conan Marin as well I think he was talking about as well so I remember they'd be coming into the county and like just mentioning it and I, that was the only kind of way it was on my radar whatsoever. And um, so other than that, like, and I suppose you'd hear about all the Irish players out here, like going Zach Toohey, Conor McKenna, all these little highlights that they have, like winning big games, kicking, winning goals. And you kind of hear about it. And um, but it was never, ever something that I was like, right, I'm, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to try do this until it was actually put in front of me. And like, I was talking to like, a couple of the people that were involved in it and the thought that I did a good shot at like, kind of maybe like getting over here. Um, and I'm pretty like when I, when something, I suppose, when I start like wanting to achieve something or something comes in front of me, I kind of, I just get like a bit of a tunnel vision thing. It's probably not a good thing, um, but it's, I just always like want to try achieve it. And this was, this was the one thing like that that happened and I just went for it then, but I didn't really have much experience with it before. And I suppose no aspirations when I was younger to ever do it. Hmm. And as you said there, like you didn't, you didn't have any aspirations of it. You didn't know, like really, you were kind of going into the unknown in a sense as well. And the initial move. So, so how many times did they actually bring you out before you went to sign the contract? Um, twice. And on my second time, I signed the contract. So it was, 
one time out um, with three other lads and we done went around to a couple of clubs, came home for a couple of months and then a couple of clubs were in contact and then one said the Gold Coast Suns said to me they'd fly me over and then in my first couple of days here they just sat me down and said that they, they want to offer me a contract. So it happened quickly but it happened, it felt like it felt like from the time I went home after the Melbourne trip to getting the contract, it felt like an eternity because I had obviously club football, county football, uh, university, and you're just like thinking, you're trying to play that, and then you're also in the back of your mind, you're thinking like, geez, what could happen here? And it just wasn't, oh, it wasn't a nice situation. Um, but I suppose it worked out all right in the end. Because hmm. you're in a situation where like every young up and coming county footballer is, is where they want to be. You're playing for your college. You had played. You got you got a few games on your bet with Sligo that year as well. And then all of a sudden this offer comes along. So you're at the crossroads. Obviously, you've got endless uh, opportunities and uh, you know things that could come of going to Australia. But then there's a lot of barriers in your way as well. Yeah, loads of barriers. Um, you know, like. <sighs> playing with Sligo and playing with my club and playing with university, like that year before I left, I was like loving life. Like I was just so happy. I suppose it was my first, I was playing, I always said to myself that I'd play my age coming up. So I was always playing, I was always going to play in my year twenties. And then I went in with the senior team in my last year twenties and I still prioritized the twenties because I just felt like it was important to do that. It was just something that I thought was important. I just never wanted to be the person to go ahead, but I did get to play a couple of games of Sligo that year. And I absolutely loved it. And I was playing Sigerson with, with DCU. I was loving that as well. And I suppose when something like this comes up, it's kind of, as you said there, like it's just like a blur of things. Like there's so much going on. And then all these like barriers start like put, going in front of you, like your family start thinking about this. I remember like going up to Dublin. It was getting close to me maybe signing. I was going up to Dublin on the train. And I was just like, it kind of hit me at once. I was like, God, I was like, I'm, like I could actually end up moving away. And I, I was thinking like, oh, imagine I go... And then, like, I can't kick football, like, every... Like, I can't, don't, can't play Gaelic every game. Like, I don't see my family, like, for a couple months, years. Girlfriends, like, you don't, you don't see your girlfriend. Like, I have a girlfriend now. I've been away from her for, like, 10 months. Um, all these all these things happen. And, like, at the time, they just kind of strand your head. But you kind of just have to get a clear, kind of clear your head a bit. Just think what you want to try to do. And it came to the point where I was just like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try go for it. And that's kind of what I do, did in the end. Yeah, like I'm sure it all happened all of a shot as well. Like I know obviously you went out to Australia twice, but it just goes like that. And I, I think I remember we, we were, you were supposed to play um, or you were down to play like an under-21 game against us or something, but you had gone to Australia like a couple of days before. And even playing like whether it be club football, college football or county football, and I don't want you to throw anyone under the bus, obviously, but was there? did you ever get the... Oh well, fuck it. He's gone now. Like that's 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 the job. Fuck like er. Was everyone kind of patting you the back and wishing you luck? Uh yeah. Like you get mixed. You get mixed opinions, I suppose, on it. Just like everything. Um, <clears throat> majority of people were supportive, and like you just have to try focus on that. For me personally, I was like, people probably just think like, oh, like he went over here, like he just didn't care about anything. But like I, it was the hardest couple months. Like, I don't care what anyone says. It was the hardest couple of months of my life. Like, I'm very lucky to say that that was the hardest couple of months. I've, but, like, the period of, like, like scared, you're going to leave and, like, you're scared you're letting people down, like, your club, your county, um, and the fact that you're leaving and, like, abandoning that. And then during the transition period from, like, I'd signed the contract, I came home, I wasn't allowed to play with my club or I wasn't allowed to play with my county due to that contract. Because if you get injured, like, they'll just take it right off you. Mm. And you're kind of sitting there like, oh, lads, like you're they're, they're trying to play a championship, championship game and you are you just arrive up to the game and they're just like, oh, like you're letting us down kind of. And like, I completely understand where they're coming from because uh, I felt every single bit of it. I it felt, I was horrible for me. But um, I suppose it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, it was something that I felt like if I was going to do it, I was going to try to do everything I could. Um, but like a lot of people were supportive. I got a lot of messages and things like that. And, and I still do people checking up on me, see how I'm going. So it, it's been it's been good so far. But um, obviously, yeah, that was a really really sh- shit period. To be honest. Yeah, you, I heard you on the on the backdoor J show that you did like a day in the life of Luke Towey sort of a thing, and people sent you in questions. And one that I found very interesting, one of your responses was 
someone was asking about uh, the difference between uh, pre-season and training for Gaelic football and the same for AFL. And you said there was just like no comparison at all. It's a professional against uh, an amateur sport. But are there like subtle kind of links coming into Gaelic games preparation that are similar to the AFL as well? Um, yeah, I think so. I think um, <clears throat> I think Gaelic is, I've always, like everyone says, it, I suppose, um, but to people out here, I always say it's an amateur sport but professional level. And I do think that is very true. Um, but in saying that, uh, professional teams and professional outfits, they have certain, I suppose, privileges and advantages. So first thing can be funding, for example. Second thing is you don't have to do anything else apart from train. Um, I suppose they're probably the two most important ones. Because um, when you go and play for Sligo or you play for your inter-county team, <coughs> you're, you are training real hard but you're training as hard as you can given like this environment you're in so you're training as hard as you can but you're still getting up for work the next morning and you're still so i think the because you have to do that you can't train i suppose at the same level that professional athletes can train at you can't push your body that extra 20 30 percent because you don't have the ability to basically recover your body in order to back it up and go again and go again so I think that's the massive difference, and that's why I don't think I like comparing it mm-hmm. because GA players do everything that they can based on the environment and the situation they're in. And then players like professional players where I'm at here, that's the big difference because I can go as hard as I want because that's all I have to do for the day, luckily enough. Do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. that's, I think, I think a lot of people would agree with that point who have experienced both professional and um, sport. Because it is a great misconception. And would that be... The obviously look at the the rules of the game and you know the shape of the ball and stuff like that are the obvious differences, but is that the one outstanding difference that you've noticed from both sports the the preparation? A preparation, yeah, but no, there's gee, I think people are under a serious misconception that these two sports are similar because they're so so different. Like, and you think you come over here and you think I'm gonna come over here. I know I did. I came over and I was just like. Probably thought because you're when you're in Ireland, you're playing, you're, you're at a certain level. You come over here and you think <laughs> you probably still think you're at that level, and then you get quickly no- notified that you're way below. So you, you come to the bottom of the pecking order. And my god, like I talk, I suppose last year was a bit of a nightmare because COVID and didn't get a full, I suppose, experience and development. This year, I'm hoping for that. But the game is so different, it's so structured. You have to know what you're doing at all times. Like in Gaelic, I you could switch off for a couple of seconds, like walk for a second or two. Some more than others, I suppose. Um, but uh, a couple of big full forwards, they'd be happy to sit in the square all day. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So like you, you have that. And you have to be switch on. You're moving all the time. The pitch is so much bigger. The the pressure on the ball, like when you get the ball, I suppose it's something. You just feel like you're getting absolutely hounded by everyone. You feel like you have no time to make a decision. That's probably because of the professional environment as well. But I felt in Gaelic when I had the ball, like I had loads of time. I could do like kind of. You had time to make decisions. You get the ball here, and basically, the quicker you get the ball and the quicker you give it off, that's exactly what they want. Basically, they don't want too many people like trying to do too much with it because that's like a, a, a like you want efficient disposals of the ball. So, like, you get the ball, you give it out. If you win a ball in a big, dirty pack and, like, just hold on to it, that's that's good as well. But the structures and just being switched on all the time, it's, it's so, so different. I suppose in the running as well, which is something I had to get very used to. The aerobic running, the aerobic capacity of some of these lads is just absolutely crazy. Yeah. I, I spoke to, so it's actually 50, 50 episodes ago, uh, Kieran Byrne, who, who was the second guest on the podcast, <laughs> Kieran spoke yeah. about preseason. They went out to uh, they went out to America, I think, and just some of the stuff that they were doing was was absolutely mental. He says, you know, your preseason in Ireland playing Gaelic football, you might have to go to the beach or something like that, you know, and you think you're putting your body through torture. But some of the stuff that you go through is, uh, you know, makes that that trip to Innescrone or trip to Strand Hill look look fairly basic, like. Yeah, but again, like I, as a, it's funny, like it's something you probably learn. It's something I learned anyway, and something a lot of people learn, I suppose. It's only the hardest thing you've ever done until you do something harder, if you know what I mean. So, like, Sligo training, club training, university training, it's the hardest thing I'd ever done. The bleep test is the hardest thing I'd ever done until I came out here. Do you know what I mean? Like, everyone, 
I suppose it's just right. It's, you can see where you can push your limits to. You think this is the hardest thing ever, and you hear a lot of people say it, and you might think it's shit talk, or whatever. But it's actually true. Like you, you, you can push yourself and find the new hardest thing ever constantly, all the time. And it's so something that we focus on a lot out here. Our, our strength and conditioning coach, he won't mind me saying it, but he's absolutely, he's like, he's crazy. Like, but he pushes you to you places you don't think you've been. I've been out. We ran up uh, eight kilometers uphill in a in New Zealand on a ski resort, like a ski resort hill. So I've never went skiing before, but this was my first experience, and it wasn't a good one. But it wasn't snowing because it was like a warm time, and it was like summertime in New Zealand. But if anyone is familiar with like ski mountains, they're like they're like go up down, or like cross the way, cross the way, cross diagonal, diagonal, and then you get the place where you get onto the ski lift and go up. And we were running on this thing, and he walked us from the hotel. Knew something big was coming. Walked us for like an hour. And we got to the bottom of this. It was called Coronet Peak in New Zealand. And um, eight kilometers. We just seen two peak, eight kilometers. And we were like, oh my God. And we, he just goes, everyone just take a piss. Do whatever you need to do. He says, we're basically running up this. So we got up and we just started running. And oh, it took us so long. But, and you just never stopped. And it's just things like that. Like you get to the top and you just think, I thought for the whole year then, I said, I'll be able to do any running session now because nothing will be harder than that. Yeah. And I think something that I probably, if I ever like went into coaching or anything like that, or if I ever come back, I reckon at the start of the year, if you do something that pushes lads to their limits, I feel like they're coming to training and, and anytime they're doing a hard run, they'll think I can do this because I've done that <laughs> thing in New Zealand and, that's what happened to me. Like every time I was doing a run, I felt that. Another yeah. thing we done this year was we done a four hour, a four hour training session. He didn't tell us when it was going to end, and we had to get through this deck of cards. And each card was an exercise. We were out there for like five, five or six hours, and like Jeez. you just you get to a stage where you're nearly crying. I was nearly in tears, and then yeah. you get off and you're, and you just think like Jesus Christ. But it's amazing what the body can do. I suppose if you, if you push it to its limits. Yeah. I know, like, you're all, obviously all at a professional standard out there, but is there one fella that you've come across that you're like, geez, he is an absolute freak of nature altogether? Yeah, there's plenty of them. I, think, yeah, not one, I don't think any of them out here are not freak of nature, to be honest. I reckon if we stuck any of them in full forward from Lost Gale, they'd probably win from player of the year. But, um, like, oh, they're, all, they're all freaks. They're all been doing it all their lives. Professional environment. A lot. Some of them have been playing professional for, like, 15 years. <coughs> um but they all are like they're all some of them some of them more than others you know you get it everywhere it's pretty similar like some people take it so seriously works for them some people might act like they don't take it seriously but like they really are you know you get all these characters but yeah the the day it's whatever works for you and and i suppose what makes you perform i suppose in game time Mm. talk to me about living out there so luke are you you living with the lads from the team or how is it working out for you yeah so i'm living with two boys from the team will powell jeremy sharp um, so they're two 21 year old and 19 year old so get on with them very well my absolute mad house to be honest um, but no it's really enjoyable I've settled with them two boys now I was kind of moved around a bit at the start went in with kind of an older more mature lad at the start but, uh, that was a bit I it was good but I just I suppose ended up moving out there and went in with the two younger lads and I suppose it's just a bit more laid back now and just a bit more chilled out and I suppose that suits me better Good stuff. And and coming in as well, I'm sure everyone was fairly accommodating for you coming in, like, you know, fellas putting taking you under your wing. Was there anyone in particular that you found was, was good to you? I suppose Pierce Hanley was here. He just retired last year. So he was at this club for the first, for my first year. Um, so I suppose he took me under his wing to a certain extent. Um, I went to him for a lot of things and, you know, any trainings, a lot, like after every training, I like to sit through every training is videoed and, I like to sit down and watch kind of everyone afterwards and pick up little things that I can do. And I sat down with him a good bit, watched a good bit of that stuff. And then I suppose it helped me outside the club as well. And outside of football, pretty important to get a break away from it. But um, he like, well, I'd go out and do things with him and we'd go out for dinner and, and drinks and things like that. And he's still here. So so that's good. He's still hanging around here. I don't think he's moving back anytime soon. He's done, he's done 13 or 14 years out here, which is a long time. So he's basically Australian at this stage. Good stuff. Uh, Luke, I, I've kind of given a bit of a mix so far of questions people have sent in and questions that I've had myself. So I have a few, um, a few that I'm going to add on to that just from what people have sent in on Instagram. Now, I can't get through every one of them, but I'll try and, and get through as many of them as I can. 
you made a bit of a point of one of them there yourself saying how you could throw any of the lads off the team into a Malachi Gales team. Is there one, any one um, Gold Coast Suns player that you could see coming over and just picking up Gaelic football straight away? Um, yeah, all right. So this is actually funny. You won't mind me saying this either. So I brought my roommate, Will Powell. Um, he's been playing, he's 21, but he's been on the list for four years. So he's been playing four years because um, they start pretty young here. They get signed professionally when they're 17, 18. So it's pretty young. But uh, so I was like, at one stage a couple of months ago, I was just like mad to go kick football. I have a football here, obviously, and I'm kicking it a good bit. But there was a Gold Coast Gales. There's a Gold Coast Gales team here. Yeah. And uh, I was getting my hair cut um, by a lad called Sean. He's from Ireland as well. And I get on with him very well. He's one of my friends out here. And uh, he's always telling me about this like Gold Coast Gales thing. And I remember he was in the off season. And I was sitting down and he, I go, what's the story with this Gold Coast Gales thing? And he just said, oh, there's training tonight. And I said, you know what? I actually might come down. I said, I'd love to go down and uh, just have a look or whatever. Just like maybe kick a ball on the side. And he said, yeah. And I said, there's no way I'm doing the training now, but I'll, I'll come down. And then anyway, I went home and I was sitting there and I was just like, no, I'm definitely doing this training. And I was like, 100%. <laughs> so I put on the kit and I got Will, my roommate, to come down with me. I, and he said he'd come as well for the crack. So the two of us went down to training and uh, got the ball. And he was very good. He was very good. Yeah. He was so good. Because their hands here are, the hands are like basically, you'd, you'd be surprised, but they're so clean with their hands. You know, we go out in the football pitch and we just, everyone starts trying to belt 45s and, outside the boots from the sideline, all this stuff. These lads, they'd go out nearly and they'd start doing handball drills before they'd start kicking or anything like that. So it's like really important to them. Um, so this lad was like getting the ball and like they do this thing where they put it over their head and like and when they're in trouble and things like that. He thinks you, when people try tackle you, they try to grab your arms. So AFL players have a lot of, uh, a big habit of like pulling their arms up as high as they can or like trying to get them away. So he was doing all this stuff and handballing it over his head into people's chests and things like that. And everyone was just laughing at me like, what? Because like, you wouldn't see that. You wouldn't see that in Gaelic. Yeah. Um, and it was very good. And his kicking was grand. He was all right, but he got better. He got better. They're not used to the inside the boot, round the body kick. It's all pretty straightforward, you know, all straight mm-hmm. kicks. But I think I I said to him, I'd get it when he comes back, he says he'll have to talk out. Good stuff. And I'll flip it now. Um, Obviously, of course, Red goes out and... You know, lads, like, as you mentioned, Conan as well, at trials and that as well. Any one Sligo player at the moment that you can see doing well in the in the AFL if he was to go out? Oh, I think there's loads of lads. Uh, geez, there's heaps of unbelievable players at Sligo, especially some of the younger lads. I know Paddy O'Connor at one stage was pretty close to, like, he'd done a couple of trials. I'd say he'd be really good at it. Uh, Liam Gahan, <laughs> your man, you know him, obviously. He's an unbelievable footballer. Um, so he's class, he's quick, uh, work well. Sean Carbine, all the all these lads, like they're all freak athletes. I reckon they could have made any any of the, the this sort of stuff. So, um, you know yourself watching them, like they're just getting better and better. These lads, um, yeah. And obviously, like when I was playing against them, it caused me it caused me a lot of trouble. And playing with them, they've done a lot of favors for me. So, mm. uh, but I reckon any any of them lads would do very well out here. That's tough. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people that move away from Ireland or something get asked this question, but one thing that you could take from Ireland and bring it over with you, I know friends, family are, are the obvious ones, but is there anything that's you know, close to you that you'd say you'd love to bring over? Yeah, apart from friends and family and girlfriends and things like yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, like an item or like it, an item, something in particular? Do you yeah. Or... Let me see. That's not an easy one. Let me think. Mm. I wouldn't. Oh, uh, there's a, there's some foods I miss like at home. I really miss uh, like you don't get the chicken fillet rolls out here. <laughs> that sounds like a terrible one, but you don't get that. Uh, you don't really get a fry up. Like, they don't have sausages here. It's like, they have sausages, but they're chicken sausages. And I'm like, yeah. get them with me quick. Um, like, I, I asked, I asked when one day I went in, I can have, like, what are sausages to make? <laughs> get these sausages, they're like white. And you just don't, wouldn't touch them. So that sort of stuff. Food, I reckon there's some food. The food out here is nice, but I'd reckon I'd try to bring out a load of food. I do get a couple of big parcels brought out to me. Potato, filled with potatoes and the, da- the dairy milk chocolate out here is actually different to at home it tastes different 
Yeah. Uh, it's bought by Hershey's and Hershey's make it. Um, okay. So it's different. Uh, so I get a lot of that stuff brought out. But I reckon even like a roast dinner, I'd love a big roast dinner. Something yeah. like that. Just all that sort of stuff. Like, And I know when I was at home, I used to give everyone my mother's cooking, like, oh, like the same stuff all the time. But I reckon <laughs> if she could send out a few dinners now, it would be great. <laughs> yeah. St- actually, sticking on the topic of food, um, like going out, obviously, as you mentioned, there's so, mu- so much different in terms of food and that. Did you go out and you're like, oh, the stuff out here is, is grand, or are you like, geez, there's some serious stuff out here altogether? Yeah, no, there is some serious stuff out here. Like the food out here is class. I sounds absolutely ridiculous now, but uh, <laughs> I never would have touched anything like sushi or anything like that when I was at home. I'm flat out eating that all the time, and it's just like I reckon when I was at home, you think someone eating sushi, you'd be like, oh, go away. Like you, like you think like, geez, <laughs> you just think they're like going to these fancy sushi restaurants eating it. But here, it's literally like. I reckon it's the same level as a chicken fillet roll. Like you just like you'd actually like just go in, pick it up, and like walk out with it and just eat it. Like it's all pre-made stuff. Yeah. I get that so much. I yeah. get that a lot. Um, but yeah, no, I the food out here is class. The ca- some of the cafes, like and all that sort of stuff. It, there's a big like kind of stigma against certain cafes out here. Everyone loves going for coffee and like breakfast and stuff. And I actually like that stuff as well. I'm a big breakfast man when I was at home. But yeah, there's some things a bit weird, like the sausages as I mentioned. But- <laughs> Everything else is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, your favorite sport and memory, Luke, from both sports, obviously. Um, favorite sport. I have a couple with at home. Um, I suppose my first game for Malosh Seniors was good. Um, I was like, uh, we're playing Drum Cliff in a relegation game, and I was really young, and um, but I came on. I was. He told me on for the last 10 minutes and I ended up going on after the first 10 minutes of the first half. <laughs> so I remember we went on that and we were down by, I think we were down by nine or 10 points or something when I came on. Um, and it wasn't nothing to me, but it was just such a good experience because they came on and we actually ended up winning the game. Like a couple of boys scored a, go- a, co- a couple of goals. And that was like my first experience. Like obviously you grow up, you want to play for the senior team yeah. all your life. I remember we won that game and that was unbelievable. Another one from Gaelic, I suppose, was when we won the All Ireland with um, DCU. That was class as well. That was unbelievable. Like all you, as I say, I suppose, a lot of dreams being spoken about, but winning All Ireland is obviously right up there, and that was an amazing experience. Out here, haven't had like <coughs> anything crazy to be honest. Um, I've just been. I suppose the first game was not pretty, so I wouldn't want that as a highlight. Um. But I suppose just I suppose coming out here and maybe this year in particular, um, we do this 2K time trial and you, like, you try to run 2K as fast as you can. When I came out initially, I was brutal and I improved that a good bit this year. So I suppose when I'd done that, it kind of set me up nicely for this year and it shows that I had a good off season. So I suppose that was a pretty, pretty good highlight this year and kind of it set me up for this year now. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. What's, what's your best 2K time? Um, so when I ran, came out here initially, I... Ran it. I'm not a good aerobic runner. I'm all right. I'm all right now, but I wasn't when I came out. I'm more speed, but I ran. Um, when I came out here first, I ran it in 7:25, and like I was second last. But this year, I ran it in 6:40. So that was that's a good bit quicker. <laughs> yeah, 6:40. Yeah. Absolutely delighted with that. I was on. It's it's the hardest thing, and there's so much like pressure on it because you know it's the first thing you do when you come back. Like they don't they meet you at the track. After off a whole off season, first thing you do when everyone runs it, and you're fu- you're caught out if you don't can't run it. But there's yeah. a lad in our team that ran it in five fifty six. Jesus Christ, that's what what per kilometer less than. Yeah, less than three under three minutes. Jesus, what two fifty whatever mother of God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Like, so I was running 320, 320 pace. So you do a uh, five laps of a uh, four hundred meter track. It ends up like maybe a bit more. And uh, like I was looking to get around in 80 seconds. That was my time. Like try to get 80 seconds in the last lap, like go basically as hard as you can and try to get it a bit less. But he's like flying around and like, oh, it's, obviously I don't see him because I have the head down trying to get around. All I know is he's finished a full lap ahead of me, but he's in a league of his own, that lad. He's a freak runner. Very last question for you, Luke. Um, your favourite boots and has your favourite boots changed since you've gone playing a different sport? Uh, right, so when I was younger, 
Uh, I used to wear everything. I used to wear whatever boots Ronaldo was wearing <laughs> till I was about 12 or 13. And then I got a pair of boots when I was maybe just in my leave and sort of 50. And they were Under Armour boots. And they were white Under Armour boots with like an Under Armour logo at the back. I don't know if you've seen them, but I'm not even sure of the name of them. Yeah, yeah. Do you know them? I know those. I got, yeah. got a couple of pairs of them and like I just swore by them. Like wore them all the time. And I always wore studs, no matter what. I know it's a weird one. Like, I always wore studs. Like, even in the hottest days, I just always wore them, and I don't know why. Um, so, it was them. Then I came out here, and uh, there's a... All right, so, have you heard of Concave? You know Concave boots? Yeah. <laughs> right, so, when we were at home, I remember, like, it used to be all these... I remember Brian Cox from Callery. He came on to our minor team, and he was wearing these Concave boots, and they were, like, pure rugby boots, because he's a big rugby man, like, and I was like, they are disgusting. I, I thought they were brutal. But Concave actually got bought over two years ago by an Australian Australian company, basically, group. And they've changed their boots completely to, like, these, like, basically AFL boots. So I came out here, and they got in contact with me and asked me, like, would I give them a go? And I tried them, and I really liked them. And I love them now, and I'm wearing them all the time. I wear, I'm, so they're my boots now, and it's changed drastically. But, yeah, no, they're the boots that I wear all the time now. And would, would you say that they'd suit you in the game that you're playing or would you, you know, if you were to go out and play a game of football now or game oh, of soccer? They're exactly the same as get it boots. They're literally like, if they could just stick a Nike crest on them or an Adidas crest on them and they'd be the exact same. Like, do you know what I mean? They're just, yeah. it's all boots are more or less the same. Like, it's just before whatever the, the logo is and how it fits your foot and things like that. But these fit me perfectly, really comfortable and never any blisters or anything like that. So I reckon if I was at home, I'd wear them, definitely. Sounds <coughs> good. Look at that, wraps everything up. And for keeping with the team of Sligo Base and Sligo Connected Podcasts, I just want to say massive thanks, Luke, for coming on. And uh, it's been a pleasure having you in the podcast. Cheers, Ryan. Thanks very much.